platform late. <laughs> we have on my right, Paul Anderson. Next to him, Oliver Sari. Hmm? I'm Gordon Dixon. This is Grace Rigard. Next is a member, well, not a member, actually, uh, an honored guest, but never really a member. Never. Bob Tucker. I'm a fake fan. <laughs> a fake fan. And uh, next to that fake fan, there's a real fan named Cliff Simak, who occasionally dabbles with his typewriter. <laughs> now, actually, Cliff should be chairing this thing. Would you care to chair it, Cliff? Hmm? Would, you, you would you care to chair well, it? What are we talking about? We're talking about the MFS. <laughs> Were we talking about such things as squanch foot, tuna fish salad sandwiches? Oh, another member of our panel here, Kenny Gray. Yes, yeah, come on up. Whether you like it or not. I wonder if this uh, is working. Page, uh, I think so. Uh, the Minneapolis Fantasy Society began, let me see now. Uh, Cliff, when did you first? Uh, you're, I, you're our senior. I've got a small story to tell you about how MFS first started. I came down here in 1939 to begin my career in a big city newspaper. I had done a lot, some writing, had published some stories, and one of my heroes at that time was Carl Jacoby. Now, I wonder how many of you remember Carl Jacoby. Yeah. At that time, Carl was writing a lot of fantasy and some science fiction, but he was also writing Borneo stories, and he was writing sea stories, and he was writing China stories. He wrote, you couldn't pick up a, uh, a pulp paper magazine on the stands that didn't have Carl Jacoby's name on it. So the first man that I visited in, in Minneapolis was Carl Jacoby. I called him up and, well, I think, I think as a matter of fact that Carl had written to me a few weeks before I came down here and had said he enjoyed one of my stories and said he lived in Minneapolis, which is why I knew where he was. So I called him up and went down and saw him and had a long visit with him, which was beautiful for me because this was the first other writer I had ever known. And no matter what you may say about it, writing is one of the most lonely jobs on earth. It isn't quite as lonely now as it used to be. But uh, when you were started writing science fiction, it was really lonely because very, very few people ever read your stories. They didn't know what you were writing. There was nobody that you could talk with about what your work was. And then in one of the science fiction magazines, a letter popped up from some Minneapolis man, and I forget who it was. I wish I could remember. Would it have been Chapman? It might have been Chapman. And I went to the phone and called this man who had written the letter and said, told him who I was and said, what about us getting together and talking one of these days? And he said, tomorrow night I'll be out with some other people. And uh, Chapman, if it was Chapman, it might have been always Sari, I don't remember. I wish I could remember. They came out, there were four or five of them, and there is when Minneapolis Fantasy Society first started. It grew from then on. Uh, to start with, it was a group that met at our house. I think it was maybe a year or somewhat more than a year. They come down to come out to our house in Kenwood. We'd sit around and talk to all hours in the morning. My poor wife was out in the kitchen making sandwiches for these kids who would make a platter of sandwiches just a player to swish. And that's really how it began. Does that, does that pave the way, Gordy? That does it very well. Now, uh, for a little backup information and fill in, our next most responsible member, Oliver Sari. Well, <laughs> uh, we were saying that, I, uh, what? You were saying that it was John Chapman. Yeah, it, it was John Chapman who contacted Cliff. Uh, uh, we knew about Cliff's stories. Uh, we had the old Minneapolis Science Fiction League. I don't know how many of you have seen some 1934, 1935 wonder stories, the Gernsback wonder stories, where 
he started the science fiction league with chapters all over the country and uh, we had uh, Johnny Chapman, Arden Benson, Bob Madsen, myself uh, were the Minneapolis Science Fiction League and when a uh, actual prototype author like uh, Cliff moved into town uh, I think Johnny Chapman uh, is the one that called him and arranged uh, to get together with him. And I will remember uh, those meetings. Uh, back in those days, uh, Cliff was selling a story a month to astounding science fiction, or it was astounding stories in those days. Uh, and uh, we had many a uh, session till three in the morning or so trying to find, uh, figure out how he would get the hero out of this or that <laughs> particular predicament. <laughs> While his wife Kay served as the best coffee that I have ever had anywhere. Uh, well, that's what now, uh, 35 years ago. <laughs> It was, it was in 1939, whatever that makes it. Well, Johnny, Johnny ended up selling himself, didn't he? He, he sold yeah, uh, several he stories. he sold a couple, right. How many of that original bunch did sell? Let's see. Well, there was you, Wondry, and... Uh, there was uh, Aoi sold, sold, Johnny sold. Yeah, I was going to... You, you I was did gonna when you came in while you were... Not till after the war, actually, yeah. yeah. But uh, uh, you sold your first one when? Uh, 1937, uh, I was a junior in high school at the time. I, I hope no one ever sees it now. <laughs> was that the door? Was that the door? No, it was a thing called Stellar Exodus. It was in Astounding Stories, February 1937 issue, Astounding Stories. It was astounding, astoundingly bad. <laughs> oh, the point is that there was, a point I wanted to make was there was a fairly high proportion of those people from the early years on up who did eventually sell. Yes. At least a few stories. Yeah. No. Right. And then uh, after the war, uh, we get into our later generation here, including my uncle here, Bob Tucker, <laughs> and uh, who, as I say, was a mister. I am not a Minneapolis fan. I never have been. I'm a fake Minneapolis fan. During the war, uh, the war, the two wars before the current war, I would come up to Minneapolis every now and then. They'd have small, they didn't call them cons, small gatherings. I'd come up, have a beer blast. They'd meet at someone's house, then we'd go out the next day and play six or eight innings of ball games. And that was my only claim to fame as of being a Minneapolis fan. I come up and help lose the ball games for them. I would point out one thing though. Minneapolis fandom is famous for one thing above all others. You may not be familiar with it unless you have read Harry Warner's history. And if you haven't, please do. Or unless you've read Fancyclopedia. Have you heard of Twonk's disease? <laughs> the birthplace of Twonk's disease. Well, the birthplace of Twonk's disease is right here in Minneapolis. It was hatched, so to speak, by Minneapolis fandom. One of them got up one morning and discovered his armpits had fallen. And he named it Twonk's disease. And that really is about my only connection with uh, Minneapolis fandom. When I cranked the mimeograph crank too long down in Illinois, I discovered that I had transplanted Twonk, Twonk's disease from Minnesota to Illinois, and that about does it. It worked out pretty well. I remember one time it came up, the softball games on Sunday, by the way, were for the purpose of recovering from Saturday night. <laughs> and one reason we could play a softball game with something of a team on each side is because we were able to pick up half a dozen brothers from the Sari family. You remember? Yeah. Who were they? Vaco and... Uh, Vaco, Art, and Marty, yeah. Right. And they were all excellent softball players. We were very poor softball players. But they realized that they had to give us a chance. They were time. young. They were young. They were That's old. true, <laughs> yes, right. In those days. We always, we always lost. <laughs> I remember watching you slide into second base some time, one time. Do you remember that? <laughs> Beautiful slide. The only thing is he stopped about this short of the second base. <laughs> and um, after the softball games, we went to a place called, I think, the Nip and Sip. Yes, that was it. Uh, you, you forget the most important part of the softball game. We would always 
Grindel Premium was the official drink of the MFS in those days. And uh, after a while, the outfielders got tired, and <laughs> they would be lying down with their <laughs> beloved bottle of Grain Gold Premium. <laughs> well, well, other I'm, people were batting and still playing. <laughs> uh, I must point out the ball didn't always get out to the outfield, you know? <laughs> that's why. <right. laughs> Uh, if memory if memory serves, Kenny here was uh, the only third baseman I ever saw smoking a pipe on duty. <laughs> Kenny was in excellent shape in those days. If I remember rightly, uh, we gathered at a place called the Paradise, a bar down in. Uh, it's now been wiped out, cleaned out, or something like that, downtown Minneapolis. Uh, it doesn't even exist anymore? I don't believe so. I haven't checked lately. I think there's a whole lot. Oh, it is? Gay 90s? Well, it, it is non-recognizable as a friendly place. We used to be able to buy this stuff for 20 cents a bottle, which meant that if you had a dollar and knew how to stretch it, you could last for hours and hours. Danny Gergen and he played chess there by the hour <laughs> on one bottle of beer. <laughs> <laughs> this was good. And Kenny uh, used to uh, discuss things with people. We were sitting in a booth one time, about six of us. It was a booth that ordinarily held four, but the conversation was good, so we were kind of crammed together. And Kenny was on the outside, last one to come in. And um, <laughs> suddenly realized he was talking to somebody else. And uh, the man he was talking to was, uh, turned out later, was a uh, circus performer. On his, on his off season. He was about seven feet two, weighed about 350 pounds. And the man was arguing away like mad, furious, waving his arms and things like this. And Kenny was sitting there and saying, no, 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 won't work. And as a matter of fact, the last I saw him, he went out of the, the place still arguing. I never did find out what it was about. Do you remember that argument, Dole? It's very unusual to see a seven foot two, 350 pound man waving his arms, you know, while somebody sits and looks up at him and keeps saying no, no. <laughs> well, Paul came in after World War II. And, well, actually, we, our flowering was after yeah. World War II. Well, actually, I think I would be an example of um, how fa fandom recruited itself and originally. Um, I really don't know how younger people get hooked in, maybe by their parents, but I had a fan letter published in a magazine. This was back when all the magazines ran um, letter columns. And Red Boggs, it was, I think, uh, noticing my address was near Minneapolis at the time, wrote and suggested I come to a meeting, and that was how I got brought in. That's interesting, because Red didn't come to many meetings himself. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's a nice fella, but he was, he's, uh, yeah. he wasn't overly social. Uh, we, had a, uh, we had a membership that fluctuated, you know, amazingly from time to time. And it got fairly high at one time. High for us was around 30 people. When did you come in, Grace? Uh, I don't remember the exact year, but I was, uh, at the time that I was in, or I was it was about a year that I was uh, came to meetings fairly regularly. The uh, the I want to say a word that the the women in the uh, old MFS tend to, somehow didn't turn out to be strongly motivated toward writing. They were more fans. Uh, one of one, another one of us is here tonight, but she wasn't prepared to come up here. Virginia, sorry, and uh, myself. And uh, Mar Marcella Rayla and Marion Rayla, two sisters. I think uh, Marcella was the only one of us who has sold, ever sold a story. She sold a small science fiction story to 1950 Imagination, if I remember correctly. Uh, Marion and I had ambitions at writing. I'm still working at it, but I haven't sold. So uh, that's about it. I have one other claim for being on the panel. I think I'm the only member who has bridged and is a, was a member of the old MFS and is an active member of the new MFS. Which is quite true. Some of the rest of us get involved. I wouldn't call us active. Well, I mean uh, the qualifications for, for membership. That's what a, whatever membership is. Quite right. Quite right. 
Um, Angelo's unable to make it. Uh, the man I'm talking about is uh, an old friend of all of us named uh, Mans Brackney. And uh, I thought he was going to be here. I didn't get in touch with him. He was out of town, which is evidently the word wasn't gotten to him in time, which is why he isn't on the panel. Uh, he and another member, Phil Bronson, uh, were uh, particular leaders in the case of finding new bars, starting new softball games, turning out new one-shots and things like this. Uh, Phil Bronson wrote a, or rather, pardon me, edited a magazine called Fantasite, which for those days was incredibly thick, you know, a, a monster of a mag. And as a matter of fact, we had a song about it, which went to the tune of, uh, can't remember the original. But anyway, the tune is, oh, fantasize, sweet fantasize, the mags may come, the mags may go. And I ask you to believe that we sang that with tears in our eyes. <laughs> you don't believe me. All right. <laughs> Very good. Um, I remember an activity of the early, or the second spate of early days, say when my early days in the group, when it was reconstituted, was um, the writing of what we called silly stories, which would be where a bunch of guys got around a typewriter, usually with some beer, and <laughs> take turns writing and follow the story where it led. You know, I still have uh, some of those in a drawer somewhere. Uh, uh, normally, Oliver Sorry, in one incarnation or another, was the hero. That was traditional. <laughs> so. So we had, for example, uh, uh, some of those that I still have in my drawer include, for example, Robin Sorry and his Merry Men. Uh, you know, Max Sorry. Yeah. Well, the famous play oh, oh, Max yes, Sorry. Play Max Sorry. Oh, by the way, uh, I um, uh, just about a year ago, for the creative anachronists out our way for their Twelfth Night Revels, I adapted Max Sorry for presentation. <laughs> well, of course, since nobody there to their loss knew Max Sorry, you know, I changed the name. I made it Mac Truck. But uh -huh. uh, uh, and you know, but the play still went over very well. Um, See, Paul, do you remember when you and I wrote a two-page, two typewritten pages, single-spaced story? In one sentence. Oh yes. <laughs> and as far as we could, as far as anybody was ever able to figure out the sentence, it uh, was grammatically correct, although we've never been sure. No, no, actually, actually, it was in uh, three sentences. You know, one sentence went for two single-spaced pages. Then the last sentence, two sentences were something like, "Oh hell," said Johnny. Sorry, the world wasn't worth saving anyway. <laughs> yeah. However. We did strike out the combined MFS in trying to graph the female figure. Am I correct about this? Or pardon me. Oh, yes, that's right. For that. Some yeah. of our more mathematically minded members. Yeah. yeah. Right. There were a number of there were a number of very you know pleasant little interludes like this. I remember uh, we had a picnic at Lakeside Cottage of Ginny's parents one time, which ended up with the um, grain belt being wasted in the most atrocious manner. We discovered that if you take a half full bottle and shake it, you go around squirting people. And this got out of hand. There's an interesting uh, little tie-in to this, though. In the process, um, some years later, I am told, I'm not sure this is correct. You can probably uh, verify it for me. About three years later, some bottles were found preserved in the mud of the lake bottom, and they were perfectly drinkable, I'm told. Yes. I drank one. That was excellent. It was. <laughs> we must do this more often. Yes. <laughs> well, there were all sorts of... Was it the genesis of the bicycle belt? I don't route? know. Somebody <laughs> asked me that earlier today, and I couldn't remember. Uh, very possibly back to those old days. Um, uh, Oh, oh, it was quite a uh, hotbed of uh, writers um, for a while. Drinkers. And, pardon? Drinkers. Oh, oh, well, that, of course. Um, maybe the two go together. Um, we had one member who, uh, when I first met him, he wasn't a member at that time, became one later, told me, you know, I can't drink. I said, we, you know, Let's continue this conversation downtown in a friendly bar. And he said, fine. He said, well, you'd realize I can't drink. So we sat down, and I think we had three bottles of beer. And by God, he was right. He couldn't drink. You know, he was 
dead drunk. Later on, I saw him occasionally, but a little later on, he discovered he liked sherry. Now, this man who to this day can't drink three bottles of beer can drink <coughs> water tumblers full of sherry with no trouble. Mar Mar oh. <laughs> Mar <Mar <laughs> Pardon me, had a little bit of chit chat between the panel here. <laughs> That's right. I was wondering who it was. Had some. Um... Gordy, can I break in here? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, just something occurred to me. I think that one distinction that MFS had was that the only science fiction fan group that ever had a dog for a member. We had, we had an old Scotty that was named Scooty, but these folks, when they came out to our house, immediately initiated him into the membership and called him Squanchfoot the Wonder Dog. <laughs> He had his own column, didn't he? Huh? He, didn't he have a column of his own in one of the fan magazines? Yeah. yeah. Who now, wrote it? He had, because Quanswood had a column. I, I dedicated the uh, city to Squanchfoot under his correct na name of Scooty. So he is, he is one, he's a dog that ranks up there in the science fiction annals. Well, there has been discussion of seeing if we can't get a crater named after him. Mm-hmm. There was a, um, let's see, I'm trying to think of absent present members. There was Bunce. Uh, Inf Bunce. Yeah. Um, Doug Blakely. Doug Blakely, Arden Benson. Oh, boy. Who were some of the Sam others? Russell. Sam Russell. Sam Russell was an amazing man. When I first met him, uh, he looked like Count Dracula and lived the part. He dressed in black. He still does. He, well, he's put on weight, though. <laughs> Huh? This is what I was, well, I'll, I, I'm giving my punchline away ahead of time. The point is, I, let me tell you a story about the original Sam Russell. Uh, he was cadaverously thin, dressed in black. Uh, his room consisted of a narrow iron cot, a square wooden table, and 18 million magazines and books on science fiction neatly shelved. And on the table was a typewriter. And he was a pure fan, and a good fan. Now, he carried a, uh, a surgeon's uh, emergency kit. Was that it? Yeah. Something like that in his pocket. And it's amazing how often a scalpel is useful, or something like that. No, it, it'll cut the twine on a package. Of, you know, uh, you want to open a package or something like this. It will also pick a lock and do various things. Uh, all right. now this. As I say, you imagine a skinny Dracula come to life. Now, as I understand, and evidently now he was, he was at the St. Louis, or he was at the last Los Angeles World Club, and I didn't see him. Uh, but they tell me he's put on weight. Now, I can't imagine a fat Dracula. <laughs> Nor can I imagine a man who sits in the bar for hours on end, which Sam didn't used to do either. But it gets to all of us after a while. Not me, no, 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 no. I, I wasn't talking about you, Bob. <laughs> Minnesotans, I was saying it yes to after a while. <laughs> when did you, you came up with the Slam Shack people at least once, didn't you? Yes, um, I came, the first time I, I met you, I came up with the Slam Shack people, and after that, Frankie Robinson and I would come up together. I think you should point out something, Gordy. Uh, one of the guests of honor is not here this weekend. Red Boggs, and I think he leaves a place to be filled. I think you should appoint, not me, no, no, I'm not working for this. I think you should appoint an honorary guest Boggs for this weekend. An honorary, we treat uh, honorary him guest as Boggs? we would treat Red as if he were here. Do you follow me? That's an excellent idea, and then we'll write Red about it. Mm -hmm. And that'll teach now, you. Pick out someone, and we'll start the works. Uh, let me see now. Uh, who, who would be a good Red Boggs? Uh, hmm. I'll tell you what, let's, let's take that under advisement so the panel can confer covertly right. while the talking can, is going on. Can we name an but you remind Red? me you remind me of something that I was going to do right. and should have done. Um, there's a little, if you remember, the rule in the old MFS was you had to attend two meetings before you could apply for membership. Something. Okay. What I was going to suggest, depending on whether the rest of you agree with me, is that we hold a, uh, we declare a couple of meetings so that we can take these 
uh, newcomers into membership. Yes, but where will we find a softball? Oh, well, we, we can try them out afterwards. You know, the ones that don't, we can throw back. I mean, the ones that don't work. Well, find out first how many of them have the initiation fee. How many of you have the initiation fee? <laughs> I see a hand. <laughs> uh, no, this was actually suggested to me by the, uh, uh, by the committee of the local convention. And I think it would be kind of a friendly thing. I have a nomination for honorary Red Boggs. The nomination is Ed Wood. Yes! <laughs> Do I hear a second? Are you seconding the nomination, sir? If so, stand up. <laughs> I move the nominations be closed in the name of Ed Wood. It's been taken under advisement the nomination should be closed, and I don't see why the hell not. So, uh, nominations are now closed. Now, you see, we need to take them into MFS so they can vote on this important matter. Do the rest of you agree? All right. I declare one MFS meeting. I close one MFS meeting. I beg your pardon. Does anybody make a motion to close the meeting? Uh, well, oh, oh, you, you mean I should close the formal meeting? Uh, close the meeting formally? Okay, let's go down to the paradise. Very good. <laughs> okay, I hereby make a motion that the second MFS meeting is open. And I do I hear a motion to close the second meeting? I'm a, we go down to the paradise. Very good. Now, I hereby open the third meeting, and I bring to the attention of the present members that we have a number of neophytes here wishing to join. And if you're agreed, they will signify their desire to become members by echoing the closing motion. <laughs> Would you give the closing motion, and we will hear it from the court? <laughs> Give the closing motion and we will get it from the audience. All right, I move we go down to the paradise. I move, move we, go we go down, down to the paradise. paradise. You're all accepted. A finer crop I never saw. Very well. Okay, now, we are now a committee of the whole MFS. As such, ready to nominate Ed Wood for what exactly was your term? Imitation Red Bogs. Imitation Red Bogs. Do I? Yeah, all right. This has been moved and seconded out of committee. However, you all know about it. Therefore, I would like a vote on the matter. You, you, you vote the matter? There's been a motion from the floor that this be accepted. This is very irregular. I'm supposed to make all the motions. Uh, that's all right, though. There's a motion from the floor. Uh, do a, has it been seconded? He seconds it. Good. All right. Do I hear an aye? Aye. 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 <laughs> Red, I expect you to be on your best behavior for the next two days. <laughs> when are you going to crank out a fanzine? Well, I've changed my name to Fibs and Marshes instead of Red Fox. <laughs> <laughs> you can't trust anyone nowadays. There's been, there's now that's exactly what used to happen in the old MFS meetings. There, there's been some, <laughs> for a lot of effort. Yeah, there's been something very irregular about this meeting, though. I think it's tried to follow Robert's rules. That's true. Well, we're in public, you know, <laughs> and I'm Rusty. Yes, yeah, being recorded too. <laughs> You're not Rusty. He's out there. Oh yes, Rusty. Rusty is out there too. Yeah, Rusty is now an MFS member. That's interesting. We must reminisce about old times one of these days. See, uh, the panel is, hmm? I was just thinking it's a rather terrifying thought. We're sitting here reminiscing about things that happened when many people in this room were not yet born. That's true. <laughs> time binding. That's time binding. Time binding? Perhaps in 50 years they can sit there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's right. Your turn is coming, people. <laughs> Wait 30 years. Yeah. Time binding. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, right. Say, Kenny, just to wrap things up, you held a number or a number of meetings were held at your place, if you all remember, and you ran into the sandwich syndrome too. In other words, pe hungry people coming in to eat you out of house and home. 
Probably. Remember that? Sorry, I don't hear you too well. <laughs> I say you held a number of meetings at your house. Yes. And you ran into the into the Simex syndrome, a number of people coming into each out of house and home. Yes. Do you remember anything special out of those particular meetings? Oh, uh, one, I'm sorry I've forgotten so many things. That one vignette that stays with me, well, uh, I was always interested in the fanzine we published, and uh, Paul and I did a lot of uh, typing for it. You could even call it creative writing, I guess. But uh, I'll never forget the night when John Gergen, who was then the editor, rounded on Dale Rostomley and said, for God's sake, Dale, don't you know this thing has to go through the mails? <laughs> Which was a terrifying thought in those days. <laughs> Nowadays. Yeah. Right. Yes, well, not all of us had homes uh, at that time. I mean, many members were students or uh, li living singly in furnished rooms, and so those of us who had homes got to be hosts, which is always a pleasure to the uh, MFS. It worked out pretty well, amazingly. We've always found a place to light, although it's, they were some strange places sometimes. Hmm? Right, 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 right. Um, what I'm going to do, I think, with the agreement of the panel and the agreement of the audience is simply go down, we're winding up here, go down the line and have anybody say anything that they would like to remember from those particular days. Cliff, do you want to lead off with any particular memory or anything? I, I, my memories, of course, are uh, I was not with you fellows as much after the end of the war. Before the war, the meetings were to a good extent at our home. And I remember the warmth and friendship